We start with breaking news this hour. A suspected Islamic extremist has fatally stabbed a married couple who were both pleased with the Talking about scenes of utter pandemonium inside. These two explosions are now one of the two extremists in the Anybody who's ever done a deployment thinks about one thing before they leave. Will I come back? Will I come back alive? Will I come back with all my fingers, my toes, my arms, my legs? Will I come back with my mind? Yeah. Day before deployment. That's what I thought about. Am I going to come back alive? I mean, they told us we were going to go into danger, but you never know. You know. I'm not afraid to die, but I have so much to accomplish. So much life to live, so many things to make. So many people to say sorry to. I needed to come back home. This whole thing started a year prior. 11 of us volunteered to do this extremely dangerous job with Marine Recon. Swimming became the focus. We needed to train people and make sure people could swim or at least survive if they fell off the boats. Swimming is a huge deal. If you can't swim, you can't be on a boat. That's just it. After everybody got comfortable swimming in their gear and their vests and their helmets, we moved to the bay. We learned how to swim in the, in the ocean and salt water. And then we went to work with the Marines. The Marines are a different animal in the water. When everybody qualified in swimming, we had to learn how to ride our boats now. It's not as simple as it seems. These boats take a tremendous beating on the water and we have to accept that beating with it. A good boat driver is a predictor of the future. He can read the swells in the water, in the situation, and plan ahead. We also had to learn how to fix our boats when they broke down. They broke down a ton. Almost every other time we went underway, they broke down. Combat Medical School is next. We learned all about patching wounds. Any kind of wound you can think of that related to a battlefield, we knew how to fix it. We knew how to make a tourniquet for it or plug it. It was an interesting class, very fun. What a weird occupation we have. Volunteering to fight, and we're always in a fight. That's the funny thing. How many people know how much fighting we're actually doing out there? Training kept ramping up. We got flown across the country and worked with some ex-Special Forces guys. These ex-Special Operations guys, they were pretty savvy. They taught us the extra stuff that we needed to know besides the obvious. Gunning was a huge focus. I mean, if you look at it, there's really no protection on a boat. Your gun is your only offense and defense. These old salty dogs had an abundance of stories and they made it abundantly clear that forward gunning and gunning on the boat period is one of the most dangerous jobs in the Navy. If there's one thing the Marines are good at, that's working at night. I mean, they are really stealthy, really impactful when the sun goes down. Working underneath a helicopter can be intense at times. It's making a little tornado underneath it, spitting up salt water everywhere. But the plus side to it is that's the second half of our assault force. I mean, we're coming up from the water and out of the sky. It's a really impressive event. Our pre-deployment cycle is not different than anybody else's in the military. You spend about a year training for this big deployment, which is gonna be eight or so months, but that year you're not seeing home at all. You're spending all that time away from your family, so your deployment is really like two years, to be honest. One full year is all over. It's time to go home, pack the bags, and go on deployment. One year away from home, one year of training, five schools. I thought about the question, will I come back alive? Will I come back alive? Eight months in the Middle East, will I come back alive? And I came up with the answer. Who the hell is going to kill me? When you come after Americans, we go after you. And it may take time, but we have long memories, and our reach has no limits.
today I saw a double rainbow. Our departure was a bit different. There were no hugs or kisses or tears. It was, an, it was an extended business trip for us. We were excited the training was over, so let's do it. We slipped off of our base across the bay and snuck on the back of our giant gray taxi. Most of the ship's crew had no idea we were on the ship, and those that did probably had no clue what we did. We liked it that way. The ship's company had a more traditional send-off. It's a sad day. Leading up to it, you sign a power of attorney and you write a will. There's a lot of anxiety for the families. You basically prepare your home for a life that you might not come back to. There's so many kids and babies crying. I felt lucky not to have kids. And then I saw my patrol leader. He had picked a spot far from us to say his goodbyes to his wife and kids. It was a strategic decision for him to hide his tears from us. The military has made him to be emotionless, but the agony of leaving a family, maybe not returning to them, it brings the toughest to their knees. As we pushed off the piers, the world around us was changing. Missiles were fired at American warships just days before, and sailors and marines were standing at attention on the rails of the ship, and messages were being passed that we had to get on station in the Middle East as soon as possible. Our pit stop in Hawaii was squashed and we hadn't even left the bay. But it wasn't our worry just yet. It began, the first day of our daily grind. We got deeper in the Pacific and the helicopters landed on deck. It was time for us to try and settle into our new home. Our new home, the Iron Hotel and the sea. What a combination. The floor beneath our feet, steel, cold. Nothing grows on it except for rust. It's hectic, cramped, loud. Everywhere you go, there's always someone there. But there is the sea. It's soothing, the fresh air. Constant motion, it's blue. The sea takes the claustrophobia away, man. It's therapeutic. medicine for your soul. The ship's force had some work to do on their guns. The gunner's mates had to qualify their new watchstanders, and quickly, because we were rapidly approaching some really interesting territorial waters. A shipboard watchstander doesn't get much action. They wait, they watch. Maybe one in a thousand ever fire a weapon outside of training, but when they do, it's a worldwide event. Publicized, scrutinized, there's paperwork, all kinds of explanations to be made. That's why they always have to be ready.
our recon team had just finished training in Hawaii and they were shuttled onto the ship during a storm. Good to see him again, but our work was about to begin. In the mornings, we received lectures, primarily on what we were going to run into over there. We studied our opponents. We learned that they're confusing. They're sneaky. They're bold. We'd eat lunch, and in the afternoons, we'd train again. Usually some sort of competition. What do we know about our enemies? They piece together their weapons like Legos. A hundred year old gun barrel with a trigger assembly made from bicycle parts. They're industrious. What do we know about ourselves? Well, a well documented history of American wars should tell you one thing, we're gonna show up, we're gonna fight. We're gonna fight under all circumstances. We're not cowards. And the most important thing that you should know about us is we're dangerous at both ends of the gun. We'd been out to sea for a while and the ship's stores were being depleted. The ship also needed fuel, so we had our first underway replenishment. For a young sailor and those who haven't seen this process before, it's usually the most exciting event of their deployment especially when the oil tanker sends over the fuel probe and it inserts into the warship. For obvious reasons, there's a lot of jokes being made about it. Everyone on the ship, sailors and marines, they play a part in the underway replenishment, whether it's humping boxes up and down ladder wells or just standing watch. During the underway replenishment, salt water is spun up all over the ship. As soon as the helicopters land and all the boxes are on the ship, we start to wash her down. Salt water leads to corrosion and rusting, so we have to get it off. The unrep and the washdown were the first two big Navy events. Marines had their events to do also. The recon Marines trained the grunts how to fast rope. Grunts are infantry troops and they can't wait to tell you about it. Recon ran a few tests down the rope to ensure safety and they briefed the grunts on procedure. Usually there's a cowboy or two in the group to try to get down the rope in record time, resulting in two broken ankles. A few of the grunts went way too fast. Some of the grunts went way too slow. 
it's important to understand that these are all just kids, most in their 20s, some in their teens. They play games in the off times. They wrestle with each other and laugh when somebody passes gas. They're thrilled at the sight of pizza or cake. They hate veggies. They stay up all night. You have to beg them to go to sleep. These kids are forced into having grown up responsibilities. The decision making of a service member is nothing like their civilian counterparts. And there's a lot of complaining about it too. Many of the kids wish they had never joined. They wish they were back home with mommy, running around with their friends. They wish they had a video game controller in their hands instead of a rifle. But they're just kids. Your recon marine is no grunt. They're God's prototype for war. They dream about battle, they pray for it. The recon marine understands the consequences of combat which makes their preparation for it incomparable. What became fascinating to me is how timid they were on the subject of war fighting. None of them bragged about their exploits. They wouldn't tell you their stories about their scars. I wanted to know why. Nowadays, stories of heroism is big business. You win a battle, you write a book, you retire, you reminisce. Not the recon marine. Battle made them quiet, humble. They stashed away their stories deep. Our first port visit was Singapore. It was my third time there, so I played tour guide. Having me as your tour guide is good and bad. I'm going to find you an adventure, but it's going to hurt getting there. By the end of the night, you'll have a story, and you'll have a scar to prove it. You can't go to Singapore without seeing the jungle. You gasp at the depth of color. Jade green trees and crystal waters. They also have these funny little monkeys. You gotta see them. The monkeys are hilarious. Opening up a bag of cookies is the best way to get them out of the trees. They'll stay with you all day if you have sweets. What a great little animal. After a hike, we ate local chow, and then we headed downtown to the Marina Bay Sands Hotel. It's one of the best hotels in the world. We got all the way to the top. Now, most have to pay to get up there, but we gathered local intelligence and got up there for free. Nighttime had just fallen and we found a tea room that just closed. It was completely empty. This is a freshman college party up in here. <laughs> we sat there gazing at the lit up skyline. Time was ticking away, we had a curfew to meet. And our conversation turned from jovial to dark. Well, it's so ingrained in us to, for rules and engagement that we have. Wait till somebody tries to kill us before we get them. So, we gotta be better shooters than they are. Hopefully, that they are not good shooters. Thinking about future events is a bad way to end any night. But, happy, happy. but that's our reality. It's a hard reality. Singapore or any port is no vacation. We were in this wild place, but only for a blip in time. 
We are travelers, not tourists. Never in one place long enough to call home because our home is the water. I'm in Singapore right now. We're at a restaurant slash bar. And I just wanted to say that I love you. We're going into what's called uh, Fifth Fleet in about a week. And that's when we're going to start operations. And I won't have, we're changing ships, so I won't have communication at all. I just miss you. I miss my dog so bad. I watch videos all the time. I'll see you later. Somewhere out there is a little green cluster of islands. The air is hot and wet. Every step you take, something moves. The trees shake. The critters are crawling, scampering animals at every single turn. Bugs bigger than your fist. The people from this land built a military base tucked inside a harbor. Then the terrorists came. They came by boat. Rounds of metal raining on the shores, cutting down all their trees. Rockets blew up their buildings. Death everywhere, the harbor water turned red. It was a massacre. And then America showed up. Our moorage was next to a Dow boneyard. These Dows were seized from opposing forces, and they now served as trophies for the military. And it was also a warning to those who would test them again. We explored their land with wide eyes. It was a playground for the adventurous. Our lodging was even better than expected, and next to it was a little martial arts dojo. The first evolution was a show of force by Assault Craft Unit 5. Their military stood on the shores waiting anxiously for the LCACs, the landing craft air cushions. The little harbor shook with the power left behind by the landing crafts. I mean, the birds were flying away and all the animals were scurrying into safe places. It was a little too much power. And remember that little martial arts dojo? Well, it didn't do so well during the show of force. John didn't bring his Gore-Tex. Johnny's like standing on the curb. You guys just pull up, open the van, get in. Yeah, that's like exactly what it was. It was a green van. I'm like, yo, is this really <laughs> big Navy? The no, I think they might have been a van. They're like, yeah, uh, people are around with like, yeah, that's that. I heard of that place. That's where like seals and them get trained. I'm like, Johnny's like, oh, shit, what did I sign up for? <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, yeah, that's Coronado. I'm like, no, nah, I never heard. Johnny thinks he's about to report to Buds. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were a little scary, dude. Well, definitely. Benny, it was freaking huge. <laughs> These are the good memories. The life-impacting memories. It's not the place you're at, but it's the humans by your side. I mean, take the best place you've ever been and then delete the people you shared it with. That place isn't so great anymore. 
Without the people, your memories are just a shell. Full disclosure here, we started a prank that would baffle our marine teammates for the three nights that we were there. A few times a day we would fill our pockets with these little mini bananas that they served us for breakfast. We'd go over to the marine compound and we'd throw them all over. The monkeys, they started converging onto the rooftops fighting for the food we were throwing up there. And the Marines kept asking, why were there so many monkeys? Well, now they know. Now these guys were fighters. All their equipment was worn out. They had ragged uniforms. They had gloves with holes in them. Decade old helmets. No matter how scrappy these guys looked, underneath their uniforms were determined hearts. They were enthusiastic. They were willing to learn. And most importantly, these guys were not afraid of anything. We had never been so serious about a training. A few years back, one of their men had fallen into the water and was chopped up by the propeller of the ship we were about to practice on. Our first training session was low and slow, static climbs up the caving ladder and recon on high alert. After everyone was confident and ready, we headed outbound to the Bay of Bengal. The sea state in the Bay of Bengal is relatively calm. However, the swells are inconsistent. It's choppy, it's really windy, and the smaller the boat is, the more it gets knocked around. It got hairy out there. Bodies were cracking against the hull of the ship. The climbing ladder is thin. There's just enough room to fit your boot into it. It's tough enough to climb that ladder in a controlled environment, but out to sea, it takes a special person to climb it. This is really all about the boat driver. I mean, it's that boat driver's job to keep the boat steady enough for the climbers to get up the ladder safely. It's easier said than done. Our boat drivers make this look a lot easier than it actually is. On the boats, you're uncomfortable at the onset. The first swell you hit in the boat is when the misery starts. Unrelenting wetness. You're cold even if the air is hot. You can try all you want to keep yourself dry, but it's impossible. The water will find a crack in your gear and then gallons will pour down into it. It's almost as if the sea doesn't want us there. The training at sea was a complete success. Our part in helping this little country was over. In the morning, recon continued with ground training. Hands-on instruction in the ways of violence. It was beautiful to see our forces equipping these underdogs with skills necessary to be vicious or competent in combat. We forget sometimes what our purpose is. We kind of get sucked into a routine. 
What pulls us back to reality is seeing the impact we have on the militaries that share our virtues. They need our help. They beg for it. So we come and we give them what they need. The harbor was deadly. There's poisonous fish, killer jellyfish, crocodiles, malaria. Not to mention, we didn't even know how deep it was. But braving this harbor was our reward for a flawless week. It's back there. Yeah, it's gone. No jellyfish. Right. <laughs> There's only two crocodiles in this water, don't worry. Yeah, no, no, don't you dare. Don't you dare walk off that. You're already there. Come on. You got it. Step out. Don't look at jump. Look straight, straight ahead and step out. Yeah! And he's down. And he's down. Okay, got it! I'll do it. Is that what I'm yeah, we'll wire. Go All right, I'll go what first. think about was how we played a part in the history of this wild little cluster of islands. A harbor once filled with the blood of their people is now a safe haven, a shelter of peace, a place where friendship is shared, where hope has been restored. Exhaustion set in after our time in the jungle islands. We hadn't slept for three days, there were too many bugs. We looked forward to being in our living space again on the ship. There we could shower, we could use electricity, we could drink coffee, and it was also the holidays. The ship tried its best to boost holiday morale with activities. There were races, weight loss competitions, movies on the flight deck, ice cream socials, bingo nights, karaoke, they even rolled out a few decent meals. We just wanted to stay away from it all. Our birthing was the only comfort during the holidays. There we were surrounded by our teammates and these are the closest people that you have to family. And the closest thing to home we had was a television. In our lounge, we watched the Cubs win their first World Series. We also saw a change in our nation's presidency. Boxes poured in from charitable organizations. Inside the boxes were items that you couldn't get on the ship, like toothpaste, soaps, candy, magazines, and stuffed animals, which we use as decorations for Christmas. The gift boxes also contained letters. Hundreds of letters poured in. They were from elementary schools, churches, clubs, and everyday Americans just praying for us. 
We read all of the letters, and they were my favorite part of the holidays. Dear soldiers, I may not know you or anything about you, but you inspire and amaze me every day. Though we are a world apart, rest assured that someone is always thinking of me. Love, Todd Fernandez. No, we're not brothers, but there's a familiar kinship. We tested each other like brothers do. If this looks barbarous to you, you're right. The living space of a warfighter is barbaric. And there's just no other way. Our ship life was easy compared to the ship's crew. There's no days off at sea for the watchstanders. If it's your birthday, you're a year older, get back to work. Thanksgiving, eat some ham, get back to work. Christmas, New Year's, back to work. This job isn't easy. We had traveled close to 20,000 miles with consistent seas and predictable atmospheric conditions. But then the sea changed. The horizon was stolen by an ominous mist. Water quiet as slab stone. On the other side of our world, we had reached a theater of a thousand battles. We had arrived in the Middle East. With only a few days out from getting on station in the Middle East, the training for our operational cycle ramped up. A few of us lended a hand with the ship's VBSS team. They don't have much time to train because they all have jobs on the ship. When they're called into action, it becomes a mad dash around the ship to find a job replacement, and then they have to get strapped up in their gear and then get on the boats. It was a lot of fun working with those guys, and they were tougher than expected. Tensions were rising as we pushed through the Arabian Sea, and we were in the dark as to when we'd be put to work, but the Ospreys came. People were being shuffled on and off the ship. When the Ospreys hit the deck, it's an above average probability that something's about to happen. As the Ospreys came, the rumors started. Rumors are a naval pastime. You hear of celebrities dying, you hear of world events that never happened. And it's hard to check the facts because the internet is constantly shut off in the war zones. Gossip started about what we were about to do out there, but we just kept our heads down and ready to boats for anything. Marines struggle to get funding for basic warfighting necessities, but they get to shoot all the ammunition they want.
and it shows in their performance. Every one of them are dead shots on the range and off of our boats. While shooting recon with the camera, I saw that their gun range routine is similar to a dance. Their footsteps soft on the deck to keep the barrel steady on target. Their movements are calculated to the inch. Up and back. But unlike a dancer, they're carrying 70 to 100 pounds of gear on their back. Night drew on the last day of our transit through the Arabian Sea. We had two more training evolutions scheduled. And one of them would test us like never before. Red sky in the morn, sailors be warned. It's a maritime metaphor for the storm ahead. Jesus talked about the red sky. Shakespeare wrote about it. Quartermasters scour the dusk line every morning hoping for any other sky than a red one. I doubted this superstition until our first day on station in the Middle East. We were tested by a series of events so mystifying that one would think that there is some credence to the red sky sunrise. Two trainings left. First was our favorite though, shooting machine guns. Until then I had shot a few thousand rounds of my gun, but only in controlled settings. Our two recon instructors had fired over 30,000 rounds each downrange, for real. Needless to say, we paid attention to their direction. Last training before operations. Woke to an early breakfast. First in line as routine. Sat on the weather decks to photograph the sunrise. It was crimson. I whispered the maxim. Red sky in the morning. Say Lucy in the morning. As we were preparing the boats for training, our boat captain had fallen ill. He was violently hurling everything out of his stomach. Not quite sure what made him green in the face, but one could guess. It was probably the eggs. Yeah, probably the eggs. No days off for the boat captain though. He was too essential for this training. At this training, Recon would be attempting a 40 foot climb up the ladder to the flight deck. We took station next to the ship, checked our gear, tuned the radios, scanned the horizon. A small boat with lights completely off idled in the darkness. It was only a stone's throw from us. Would have been no issue except we didn't have ammunition on board. We radioed to the bridge. The little boat wasn't at idle anymore though. It was driving at the ship. We planned our actions frenetically. Marines pulled out sharpened blades, and then our boat broke down. We were stuck. Luckily, the ship had a safety boat in the water with us. Unlucky for them, they served as a buffer between the ship and the little boat coming at them. I was uneasy. I couldn't stop thinking about the USS Cole, blown up by the same size boat in the same body of water. And 
then that little unlit boat turned away. Our sickly boat captain and engineer fixed the boat. It was time for recon to climb. The ladder was slick from the night's moisture. Marines didn't complain. The light only lit up half the ladder. Marines didn't care. A night with rocky beginnings turned smooth as Recon climbed a ladder so high it disappeared into the night. Our first man overboard happened while giving fun rides to midshipmen. I won't say which one of us fell off the boat, but he skipped across the water like a flat rock on a lake. That was the only funny man overboard. The next one was intense. We had a re-enlistment ceremony in the San Diego Bay. The boats were packed with several first-time riders. First-timers always underestimate the ride. We tell them to hold on tight, but we should probably tell them to cling on for their life. It was a chief that fell in, and he didn't go easy. Most of us thought that he broke his neck from the fall, and he would have broken his neck, but our boat captain pulled off a miraculous turn to avoid him. Third man overboard happened during a day-to-night training with recon. The Marines brought their own safety boat and a rescue swimmer for the event. The water was choppy in the morning and our boat smashed against the training vessel. My body was beat up pretty good, but my gun, my poor gun broke to pieces. We did a lot of waiting around watching recon zip up and down from the helicopters. Then a shrill voice came over the radio. A Marine fell out of one of the helicopters from a height that some wouldn't survive. The Marine safety boat was called to rescue the Marine that fell out of the helicopter. But in a bout of panic, their rescue swimmer flips out of the safety boat and into the water. Now, two men in the water. So we drive in and save the Marine that fell from the helo, while the Marine safety boat was rescuing their rescue swimmer. Turns out the Marine that fell out of the helicopter wasn't even a Marine. He was a Navy corpsman working with the Marines. This brings us back to the fourth one. We pulled away with no sign of the Marine in the water. 10 seconds. He was being dragged to the ocean floor by his vest. Our other boat came in 15 seconds. All of us had torches scanning the water 20 seconds. Then a gasp of air came out of the darkness. He was alive. Every Marine on the boat had a hand or two on their brother as they pulled him out of the water. The last training ended on the strangest day I've ever had in the Navy. How could there have been so many bizarre occurrences in just one day? Was it the red sky sunrise? Was it proof of a nautical lore? Was it a maritime mantra or happenstance? Eh, I googled it man. The sun's red sometimes, sometimes it's green. We saw that last deployment, we saw it three times green. It doesn't matter what color the sun is when you wake up, does it? Every day is a new adventure. It's all in the preparation for that adventure. You can prepare for everything or you can prepare an excuse for when everything fails and pretty sure you can guess how your military prepares. Every day is an adventure. Specifics about our operations won't be talked about, but frankly, there isn't anything good to say. I wish I could tell you that we saved some people from bad guys. We didn't. Wish I could tell you we fought valiantly against a worthy opponent, but there were none. No valor, no medals, no stories worth telling. At the halfway mark, your deployment turns into a battle between your ears. You wait for a mission, but you don't hold your breath. It might happen in 10 minutes, it might happen next month, or never.
Recon and their support unit would end their deployment duties on land. Our work with them was over. I grew close to many of them, and by the end they trusted me with stories of Afghanistan, Iraq, and how they earned their medals. The stories are sobering, many of which I wish I'd never heard. Above all branches or forces in our military, my affinity lies with the Marines. No, they aren't polished. They are thick-skulled, rambunctious, moody, and brooding. I met a lot of Marines I don't like, but I respect every single one. They are those that go where nobody wants to. They walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They fear like the rest, but the fear is suppressed by their honor and duty to die for an America they hope to return to. Yeah, I like Marines. We set security off the Iranian coast. It was a one-day job with some exciting moments. They play chicken with you up there. See how close they can get to the ship without getting shot. No use in getting worked up over them though. They are just lambs locked in a cage with a grizzly bear. We pushed back down to the Gulf of Aden as the Marines fulfilled their final duties of deployment. Our last assignment was escorting the grunts to Africa. We had a lot of downtime and the sun was beating. There were also rumors of whale sharks off the coast. We had a swim call. We didn't see any whale sharks, but it was still a good time. The Arabian Sea and Gulf of Aden was dead. A desert in the water. I spent more time than anyone looking for sea life out there, wishing for a great picture. Sometimes you'd see a flap or splash in the distance, but most of the time the water was just lifeless. As the grunts pushed ashore, we spotted dolphins. They were little ones. Cute little friends. And the next morning, hundreds of these little dolphins swam and jumped around the ship. A crowd formed on the starboard weather deck to witness this spectacle. Then curious fingers pointed to a group of boats circling and stirring the water in the distance. Men were standing in these boats. Our fears confirmed they were hunting these little dolphins. The men corralled a group of them. They leaned over the boats and hacked at the dolphins with machetes. You could see the blood in the water as the dolphins splashed to get away. Nothing made me tear up this deployment until that morning. The military trains us to kill. Moments like these create the desire. It was time for the journey home. Farewell, Middle East. What I saw of you, I hope to never see again. After another 70 days at sea, we stopped in Guam. It's a less extravagant version of Hawaii. We spent the first morning walking in one direction, away from the ship.
midday, I met up with the guys and we played around at a hotel. There were a lot of Japanese tourists there, and they kept taking pictures with our Afghaner Johnny. They thought he was famous. Our military calls the end of deployment a decompression phase. They take you to a paradise, and it's the military's way of saying sorry. Sorry for what you saw, sorry for what you had to do, and sorry for the food. Go ahead and take two days off, enjoy the beach, and make sure and report back to the ship standing on two feet. See, I've been to paradise across this world, it's all the same. Blue water, green trees, calm breeze, wildlife, and your life moving at a snail's pace. It's naive to think that those days on a beach is going to calm us all down. It's the human condition, though, to think that a tropical island will cure the year's compressed anxiety. It's nice, don't get me wrong, but on the way home, we all just want to go home. This tropical island is no paradise for me. Green trees, calm breeze, you can take. My paradise is a place where I'm listened to, where I'm loved, where there is discovery and adventure. My paradise is not in this beautiful place or any other that I've seen in this world. My paradise is with my puppy. In Guam, we remembered what food was supposed to taste like. So in Hawaii, we picked out buffets, pizza, fresh fruits, vegetables, tastes and portions of our homeland. Our last adventure, we drove past the pineapple fields and coffee groves on our way to the North Shore. We took a guide boat to a feeding ground for Galapagos sharks. These sharks are big but not man eaters. Pleaded with our tour guides to let us swim outside the cage, but they wouldn't allow it. It wasn't long before old Craig lost his lunch inside the cage. It turned out to be a good thing though. With the water chummed, more sharks came to visit. It was our last night of liberty on deployment. No curfews. Two rules were given to us, don't die, don't get arrested. There were a few close calls. <laughs> I love sexy. Let's get going. I just want to make sure he's alright. Yeah, I'm good. He's fine. You good? Nice. That looks good, buddy.
With the parents on board for the Tiger Cruise, it was time to feast. First two days, the food is good. Then reality hits. The good food runs out, and we're served the same prepackaged junk that inmates receive. It was funny watching the Tiger Crew's parents eating this food. They were joking about it. They earned a new appreciation for their sons and daughters who serve and have to eat this food each day. We packed our belongings, our gear, and our guns. We checked our weight after all the binge eating. We only had one more day to goof off in the birthing. Last hours with the Marines, our new friends who we'll probably never see again. We could see the California coast from the weather decks. First off, the ship were the helos. One by one, they flew away. I readied my cameras for home. all smiles as we boarded our boats and journeyed 40 miles to Coronado. It's a relief you can't compare. A crowd awaited. Friends and family, beer on ice. Craig got to meet his son for the first time, born a week prior. An emptiness remained in me. The return was bittersweet. The bitter. Four members of our team had never deployed before. We told them they would go see the world. We told them that they'd go on new adventures and new lands and they'd eat foods they'd never tasted and they'd hear languages they'd never heard, but they saw Singapore, they saw the sand, and that's it. Seven days of liberty in eight months. Our warship taxi didn't even cross the equator. Our promises to them, lies. The suite. Deep in the warship was a well deck. This was the only place where I could be alone. The air was too hot down there for anyone else. Humid, machines running, and loud. The walls of the well decks were painted with names. The names on the walls are the passengers of Flight 93 on 9-11. Their spirits push me. I'd say one name out loud, Christian Adams, then go. Lorraine Bay. Alan Beaven. Down in the well decks, I remembered why I joined the military. They were a bodily. Not because I needed a job, not because I needed adventure, not because of the bad guys. I joined because one day, Thousands of us died for no reason. William Cashman. Thousands more died after, and we're still dying. Patricia Cushing. Jason Dahl. Joseph DeLuca. Patrick Driscoll. Edward P. Felton. Was it crazy to join at my age? Yes. Colleen Fraser. And it was uncomfortable every single day for five years. With the names on those walls and a hot warship in a nasty place made my comfort an afterthought. Linda Gromley. Richard Guadagno. Leroy Homer. Toshia Kuji. Cece Lyles. Hilda Marcin. Valeska Martinez. The sweetness after the bitter. Louis J. Naki in second. I made a promise. Donald Peterson. I would never again check my pride Peter anywhere. Peterson. My pride for Donald enduring Oliver. and respect for those I served with is in me now. Dean Snyder. Stuck there. John Until Telegani. my soul leaves my body. Honor Wainio. Deborah Welsh. 